In life, we can truly say that Bridgie cherished the gospel of Christ. May Christ now greet her with these words of eternal life. Come, blessed of my Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You're all very welcome to Mass this morning, to Kilother, for our Sunday Mass. This morning, of course, we bring her mortal remains here to the church that she is known, in which she was baptized as a little girl, and where she worshipped all the days of her life. And lived all her years here amongst this community in the Mill Dam and in Kilduff. She was a very special person, as typical of the older people and people of Red Hill. We spent many, many hours talking. Bridgie was always the last of the first Friday calls because you just couldn't go into Bridgie and leave. You had to stay at least an hour, and not that you had to, but you wanted to, to listen to her and all the tales of the past. So with our taking leave of Bridgie, we're taking leave of so much of the folklore and of the genealogy of this area as she knew the seed, breed, and generation of each and every one. And Cubert, Michelle, and Pat, and of course, welcome as they take leave of their mother, and all of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren and her nieces and nephews. We remember also in this Mass, though, we remember her neighbours, Patrick and Elizabeth Mulvaney, and all the deceased of the Mulvaney family, remembering Eddie. Also, Michael Connity and Philip Hayes, whose anniversaries occur at this time. We remember, of course, David. Much with the help of Bridgie, of the Murphy and the McGrath families here in Red Hills and beyond. Her children, her great-grandsons, Mark and Scott, have brought to the altar a few things that she couldn't do without, that she enjoyed very much and helped her living. Her TV remote control, the Celt, the Daily Mail, and Ireland's own, and of course, her hearing aid. And her children, Pat and Michelle, bring forward a pair of wellies, representing her love of the land and farming, and the sod of turf from Kilduff, the place that she loved and had devoted the whole of her life to. And so as we begin our Mass, as you remain seated, We pause, as she done so often in her life, to recall our own sinfulness and the times that we have failed and ask the Lord for his forgiveness. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I've greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. 
Therefore I ask the Blessed Mary of a Virgin, all of the angels and the saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us of our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. And let us pray. O God, who has set a limit to this present life of ours, so as to open up an eternity, an entry into eternity, we humbly beseech you that by the grace of your mercy you may command the name of Bridget McGrath to be inscribed in the book of life. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. So I invite Niall and Jamie to come forward to read for us the first and the second reading. Ecclesiasticals. Those who honor their parents will atone for their sins, and those who respect their mother are like those who, for kindness to a parent, will not be forgiven, forgotten, and will be credited to you against your sins. 
the word of the Lord. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. As John stood with two of his disciples, Jesus passed by and John stared hard at him and said, Look, there is the Lamb of God. Hearing this, the two disciples followed Jesus. Jesus turned round, saw them following and said, What do you want? They answered, Rabbi, which means teacher, where do you live? Come and see, he replied. So they went and saw where he lived and stayed with him for the rest of that day. It was about the tenth hour. One of these two who became followers of Jesus after hearing that what John had said was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. The next morning, Andrew met his brother and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. And he took Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked hard at him and said, Simon, son of John, you shall be called Cephas, meaning the rock. The Gospel of the Lord. She was all of nine years of age as she stood in the back hall of house awaiting a setting of eggs. When the word came through on the big Marconi wireless from the kitchen within that war had broken out across Europe. She had been sent over the road past the mill at McInerney's and the school at Shannohood Wood, down by the hill at the mill dam and in by the wood gate to cross by Venable's domain with a big penny in her hand to ask of the housekeeper in the large dwelling house along the Scots House Road for a setting of eggs to put under a light Sussex that had started to show signs of clocking at home in Kilduff. She could remember well that first September day in 1939 as we sat looking out the side window at the red roses blooming those 80 years later, and she recalled in her mind's eye the little girl in a cotton frock standing there in the stilly silence of the big house as the light streamed in from the back door ajar, elongating the shadow of this little girl across the polished black and terracotta tiles of the back hallway. The housekeeper, she remembered, stopped still alarming the little girl, the eggs in her hands, looking out the window over the deep Belfast sink, ready to run the eggs under the water, as the hesitant voice of the king could be heard over the crackling signal coming through on the BBC home service that Mr. Howe had always, had, at all times, tuned into. She, though only nine, felt in those moments that even the birds in the trees had given up their song as people of every race and creed across the world heard the news of the beginning of the Second World War, not knowing what would ensue. She told this as she thought back and how all had changed over the months and the years to come. She remembered the fields being ploughed in Venable's estate and the little shops around the village green now dealing in ration books. Tea, sugar, flour and nylon tights became valuable commodities in the cross-border trade down from Bachna Lane in the dead of the winter nights. All was recounted from her chair looking out the window as Declan sat listening behind to his mother recount tales of bygone years. And so it was each month I visited as we sat in the stilly silence, travelling back to a bygone age around Red Hills when she was but a girl. And as I visited the homes of the sick and the housebound most first Fridays of the year for over a decade now, I have met with people, extraordinary in the midst of the ordinary, whom I've befriended over those years as I listened to their stories and tales told of lives lived around these parts, and equal in in her extraordinary 
was this lady I first met those years ago in her little home down that little lane in the townland of Kilduff. I found her mostly sitting in her chair in the corner of the kitchen, the light of the day entering the window, rising in the sky as the seasons passed, beside her paper, a magazine or the Ireland's own, one of which she always seemed to be engrossed in. On my rounds, she was the final house, as I said, I would visit, for I knew that I would need time, no other engagement to call me away, time to sit back and listen to this lady who loved nothing more than to recount times and events from decades past of lives lived in the midst of the ordinary and the everyday, as one thing led to another and the social hill history of Red Hills and its surrounding hinterland was pieced together in the preceding hour or so. One might wonder how a friendship can grow between two people for whom decades divide, but in talking with this lady, one let go of the years between us, and one became present to the person who dwelt therein, a woman without pretensions or agendas, one whom time had molded and shaped in the palm of its hand, one for whom the struggle of life had created a serenity, a serenity that dwelt therein, casting aloft the facades that a lot of us create as we go through life. Oftentimes we would chat so long that the sun would set and twilight descend unbeknownst to us, but for the shadows that fell between us, and the reason for which I had came was forgotten to bring our Holy Communion. And in this hour, God, though, was very present, and I knew that these were special moments, hours that I would recall in the years that were to come. I looked forward to these visits as the years passed. I learned about knee replacements and hips too, as people that lived in each of, and about people that lived in each of the townlands who were long gone to God, people that I would inquire about when somebody had died. Bridgie was my first port of call. I'd ask about who their father and mother was and so forth, and she could tell me in detail about each and every one. For me, I could share with her, and I did often, the cares and strives of my life. Sharing with her in those moments that which entered my mind in the little hours of the night, always in the knowledge that my story remained with her in this kitchen. Bridgie has been one of those people who enters your life and my life who left a mark, indelible in nature, that will continue with me every day of my life to come as I remember her. She was born over 93 years ago in the townland of Kildoff on the 9th of July 1930, when Ireland was in its infancy. W.T. Cosgrove and Common and Gale were in government unopposed since 1922. The Wall Street crash had occurred the previous year, which sent shivers down the spine of the world's economy. And to say the least, the market for Irish agricultural produce had collapsed. The population of Ireland was but 3 million, and the majority of its people depend on small agriculture holdings for their living, just as the Murphys did. Electricity, running water, or sanitation was still a pipe dream. Kalian, of course, was the mainstay of people's social life as they visit each other every night of the week. And there in their midst, Bridgie learned the art of conversation. She was born the third of six children, born to Hugh Murphy and Rose Coyle, who married in January of 1928. Pat, James, who died as a child, Bridgie, Rose, Huey, and Eddie. She attended school in Kilother with Mrs. Gallagher, who had previously had taught her mother Rose and the infamous Master Cairns. Their classes took place in the hall in Kilother as people collected money locally to build a purpose-built school with classrooms on the site that we know today. The girls in her class were Maura Kelly, Kathleen Sharkey, Alice Rudden, and Mary Kate Riley, all of whom she remembered, poor Alice, who died so young in the evenings and mornings that were to come. Before school, she worked hard on the farm in Kilduff, eking out a living, as with all of her neighbours, to try to make ends meet. Their difficulty was exacerbated, as you know, when our father, Cuey, had to have his legs amputated, though he still worked hard at night to break stones to make the roads in the days that followed. Life was not at all easy, but people then, unlike today, 
didn't expect that it was going to be easy. As they grew observing the lives that their parents and the neighbours around them lived. Work and hard work was part of the everyday. Resilience was built so as to merely exist and not to provide any luxury. But these years were full of memories as she delved in, into, into them with ease. Times and faces that the years have left behind and very few people are left to recall them. Days spent with her father on Elton Bar Bog at Gannon's Cross to cut turf for the fire come the winter. Her confirmation in Belturbet in 1940 in her little white dress and veil. The aforementioned day that war broke out in September 1939 when she was set, sent for that setting of eggs and the start of the beginnings of the emergency and rationing and the struggle that ensued. She remembered attending a plain chant festival in the old cathedral in Cavan and then mass in the very same church, only this time it was situated in Ballyhays after being moved stone by stone out the road. At 14 years, in the midst of the emergency, she left school and both herself and Susan Hegarty, her dear friend, found work in St. Phelan's Hospital in Cavan with the board at each week and returned home on their bicycles to Kilduff for dances at weekend. She worked too in the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast, but her heart was here at home in Cavan. At 16 years, she saw and fell for a man, 10 years her senior, as he cycled by the road at Kilduff, and nothing would do but she got her cousin Molly to make a new frock for her, and there again she met him at a carnival in Red Hills. He was one Max McGrath from the Mill Dam. She knew right then, when she eyed him across the floor in his suit of clothes, that one day she would marry him. He was a strapping young army man based in that lone barracks during this time of the emergency. And every weekend he cycled from Athlone on Sunday afternoons to play football for Red Hills in the field at Kilifana and cycle back in the evening to the barracks. After six years of dancing at carnivals and sprees here and there, they married here in this chapel after morning mass on the 29th of October 1952. Her bridesmaid being her sister Rose and Max's be best man being Brendan McEntee. They settled at the Mill Dam, Max's home place, his parents having both died in 1946. Here she gathered her family around her, Kathleen, Eamon, Rosemary, John, Hubert, Declan, Michelle and Patrick. These were not easy years either, without mod cons that we take for granted today. No running water, no washing machines, no way, easy way of doing anything. But the Mill Dam was a place of welcome as friends passed the road and called for tea. Men on their way to Drummina and Trehu of a Sunday night or before midnight mass. Bridgie was always on hand to provide. But in the midst of it all, in 1960, she caught TB. This was a most difficult time for her children and the McGrath family, as they were separated, whilst B Bridgie spent six months in Listarn and another 18 months in Peamount. The older ones remained at home in the Middle Dam under the watchful eye of Max's Auntie Jane. Hubert and Declan lived with their grandparents in Kilduff, and a memory of the two little boys standing in the garden and Cubert saying to De Declan, I'll always mind you. And Michelle and the Gilroy stayed with the Gilroys in Bruskin. In 19... <coughs> this was a time of great upheaval for the family, as they didn't know when their mother... They didn't know their mother when she returned in 1962. In 1966, the family moved back to Kilduff to live with Bridgie's mother and father. Here... She was back to the place where it all began for her in the years to come. And the family, one by one then, began to move away to jobs in Dublin and England. A widow at the age of 52, Max died 41 years ago, and Bridgie and Declan in the years to come were left together in Kilduff. She always said she was at her happiest when herself and Declan were together. The two have lived extremely happy lives in each other's company with visits from grandchildren from Dublin, Wales and Cavan and elsewhere over the years. In the summers, all gathered and there were marquees and tents as the family celebrated as each year passed. Her home in Kilduff, as many know, has welcomed neighbour and friend. She loved Caelian, most of all with her neighbours, Pat and Katie Smith. She loved them dearly, a place where she could rest a while. Here in Kilduff, all things were left aside to give the caller time 
time to sit and chat, time to be listened to and tell your story. In a busy world where nobody has time to stand and stare and listen to the heartbeat, for those of us who called, she's been a constant over these past years. An easy chair to sit in by the window and be listened to and to listen to her. She used the wisdom gained through heartache and trial to give perspective on one's life. She has been seen ups and downs in her life and has worked hard throughout. Her life has been about making sacrifices for others from her early days. But because of those sacrifices, she was at the centre of everybody's life as they gathered round her in these past years to care for her in her turn. Kathleen and Paul Monk constantly on call from Dublin for hospital appointments, leaks and hedge cutting, farm management. In this past years, Hubert and Michelle have moved home permanently to be with Bridgie and Declan and to look after them. Our carer Mary McDermott was a constant support, as well as John Smith and neighbours and friends. They will all miss her company and friendship, for she was great company. At the centre of her life and that which brought her contentment was her God, a lesson we can all learn, the God that she turned to every day through the hardships of her life. And now, today, as she turns the road that leads to God, she will look back on all that has been over these 93 years, knowing that she hasn't lived an easy life, but she's lived a good life in the midst of the ordinary and the everyday. And just as the little girl stood in the back hall of Howes those years ago, awaiting a setting of eggs, so this morning, as the light streams in, elongating her shadow on those who are left behind, she waits in the back hall of heaven, awaiting God, the God of her longing. And she'll tell him, as only she can, of her memories and all the people she met or the days of her life. Eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her, and may she rest in peace. And may her soul and the souls of all the faithful departed to the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. And so now we have our prayers of the faithful. Rachel and Matthew to come forward to read for us our prayers. As we gather today, we give our thanks to God for the presence of Bridget in all our lives, as a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother, and a friend. We give thanks for all the love and care she showed to us. May the Lord grant her eternal peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. <clears throat> we pray for all the members of Bridget's family, Eamon, John, Hubert, Declan, Pat, Kathleen, Rosemary, Michelle. Her, great, her grandchildren and great-grandchildren, sons-in-laws, daughters-in-laws, brother Hugh, sister-in-law Mary, nephews, nieces and relatives. Lord, hear us. Lord. As we reflect on Bridget's life, we pray that we and ourselves may imitate herself, sacrifice and her hospitality for all. We pray that we may have something of her open heart and care for people and welcome the strength, friend and stranger, Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for all who cared for Bridget, her carer, Mary McDermott, her neighbours and friends, her devoted family members, and all the staff of Esker Lodge who cared for Bridget in these last months. Lord, hear us. We remember to see Smith members of Bridget's family. We remember her husband, Max, her parents, Huey and Rose, her brothers, Pat and Eddie, and her sister, Rosaline, and all the deceased of the Murphy and McGrath families. Lord, hear us. Finally, we pray for Bridget that after a road gently trodden, she may reach at last to her eternal home. Lord, hear us. In remembering Bridgie, we remember those whose anniversaries occur at this time. We remember Michael Conaty and Philip Hayes. We 
you remember Patrick, Elizabeth, Mulvaney and the deceased of their families. We remember Seamus Boylan and all our dead, including Daisy Mulholland, whose funeral takes place tomorrow. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Father, these are just some of our prayers. We ask, them, ask you to hear us and answer them as you know best. We ask these and all our prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. So now we bring forward the gifts of bread and wine to the altar. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. The Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands for the praise and glory of his name, for the good and for the good of all this holy church. O God, be near, O Lord, to us this day as we pray for your servant Bridgie, on whose funeral day we offer you the sacrifice of conciliation, so that any stain of sin that it might have clung to her or any human fault have affected her, it may by your loving gift be forgiven and wiped away. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you all. Lift up your hearts and let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and eternal living God. For it is at your summons that we come to birth it is by your will that we are governed, and it is at your command that we return on account of sin to the earth from which we came. And when you give the sign, we who have been redeemed by the death of your Son shall be raised up in the glory of his resurrection. And so with the company of angels and saints, we sing the hymn of your praise as without end we proclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fountain of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dew of the morning, so that they may become for us in this Mass the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed, he entered willingly into his passion. He took bread and he gave you thanks. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the cup again, he gave you thanks and praise. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
And let us proclaim the mystery of faith. When you eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be here in your presence this morning and in our lives to be able to minister to you. Humbly we pray that by partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread across the world and bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, with Martin, our Bishop, and all who serve and minister in your church. Remember in this Mass your servants, Bridgie and Max McGrath, and all the deceased of the McGrath and the Murphy families. We remember too Michael Connity and Philip Hayes, Patrick and Elizabeth Mulvaney, and all the deceased of the Mulvaney family. We remember Seamus Boylan, who has died, and Daisy Mulholland. Grant that they who were united with your son in a death like his may now be one with him in his resurrection. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with Mary, the mother of God, with the apostles and all the saints who have pleased you through the ages, we, when our days come to their end, may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and there to praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours forever and ever. Amen. Jesus taught us to call God our Father, and so we have the courage to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day, that with the help of your mercy we might always be free from sin, and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. And the peace of the Lord be with each of you always. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world of mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. This is the Lamb of God, this is Jesus Christ who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are we who are now called to a supper. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. And may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to all of us who receive it. For celiacs, there will be gluten-free hosts here on a little table in the sanctuary if you want to come forward.
I invite Kate now to come forward to say a few words. Hello everybody. To all those who have travelled near and far, our neighbours and friends, thank you all for your kindness and support, and especially the candlelit tribute to Mam on her final trip home. A special word of thanks to Jared and his team for their professionalism shown to us over the last few days. Our families go back a long way and there's something comforting about familiarity. To Mary McDermott for your empathy and dedicated caring for Granny Gra over the years and for always being at the end of the phone. And for John Smith, who has been part of the furniture in Kildo for so long, for your willingness and again always at the end of the phone. Thank you all to the medical staff at Cavan and Monaghan Hospitals. A special thank you to Dr. Monica and her team for all their help and support to Mam and to us over the years. Like many people, Mam never wanted to go into a nursing home. But when it came to it, she ended up in the right place in Esker Lodge. To all those who work there, a very heartfelt thank you. We as a family are internally grateful for the care, kindness and dedication shown to Mam and to us over the last few months. To Father Jason, as always, played a blinder with his eulogy. I'm convinced he knew Mam better than the eight of us put together. She loved your chats and treasured your visits. Your company lifted her spirits. It's been a tough couple of mo months with one thing and another. So on behalf of all my siblings and extended McGrath family, we wish to express our gratitude to you all for coming together as a community to support us in celebrating this beautiful Mass. And I have a P.S. I can hear Mam saying, if anyone has been left out, would they please leave their name at the back of the chapel? Thank you. Oh, you know me. I'm only 
Thank you, Eamon. I know she'd be very proud today to think her neighbour sang at her funeral. And to thank Teresa, the Karenin, to thank all who partook in the Mass, all our readers and those who brought up gifts, Kathleen for her lovely words of thanks, and each and every one of you who have participated, our sacristans and everybody, uh, undertakers, Jared, and everybody who has helped the family, especially our neighbours over these past days. They have been a great source of strength to Bridgie, and allowed her to live her life for near on 94 years in the place where she was born. We will have sympathising after the prayers of accommodation, but obviously as COVID is quite rampant in the hospital and in places like that, we'd ask you to please, without exception, to file past the family. If you don't mind, it just takes one to stop. And when you shake one person's hand, you're actually shaking the whole congregation. So... Uh, when in something like this, so be very, we need to be very careful. So we'd ask you to file past the family after the prayers of commendation. Lord God, who left us, whose son left us in the sacrament of his body, food for the journey, mercifully grant that strengthened by it, our sister Bridgie may come to the eternal table of Christ who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Before we go our separate ways, we take leave of Bridget. May our farewell express our affection for her, may it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope, and one day we shall joyfully greet her again when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself.
receive her soul and present her to God most high. May Christ who called you take you to himself. May the angels lead you to the bosom of Abraham. Eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our sister Bridgie in the sure and the certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, she will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you've bestowed on Bridgie in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn towards us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to Bridgie and help us who remain to comfort one another with the assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and we are with you and Bridget forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. So now, following the directions of Gerard and Gavin, I'd invite you seat by seat to come forward, to pass by and to make your respects.
To you, O oh Lord, we humbly entrust Bridgie, so precious in your sight. Take her into your arms and welcome her into paradise, where there will be no more sorrow, no more weeping, no more pain, but only the fullness of peace and joy. We ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. In peace now, let us take Bridgie to our place of rest in Cullis Graveyard. My faithful friend, it's been so long since I've sailed away from my own native home. But Ireland's always been here on my mind. And oh, what I give is to be there one more time. And always have an Irish heart. No matter where I go, I know where I came here from. My homeland and I will never be far apart, for I'll always have an Irish heart. My faithful friend, my time has come to leave this world and to enter God's home. I pray he will fly me high, he'll understand. I need you to say goodbye to my Ireland and always have an Irish heart no matter where I go and know where I came here from my homeland and I will never be far apart, for I'll always have an Irish heart. Irish heart. 